<laughs> All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, once again, welcome to the Power of Narrative Conference. My name is Kyle Plants, and I am a conference coordinator um, and a former BU alum as well. Um, in today's session, uh, keynote, we are uh, with David Farenthold. Um, and the title of this is What to Do When Nobody's Talking, Lessons on Covering Secretive Organizations, Learned Over Five Years Writing About President Trump's Business. And uh, I'll give a brief intro to David, although he definitely does not need one. Uh, David is a reporter covering the Trump family and its business interests. He has been at the Washington Post since 2000 and previously covered Congress, the federal, federal bureaucracy, the environment, and the DC police. David is also an on-air contributor to NBC News and MSNBC. And in 2017, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for national reporting for his coverage of Donald Trump and his alleged charitable givings. So David, I'm gonna let you have the floor here for a minute. I just wanna let everyone know that the Q&A function is open. So please drop in any questions um, throughout his uh, talk and uh, we'll pop up back on and uh, get to as many of them as possible. So David, take it away. Well, thank you. I really uh, am honored to be here, very flattered to be here, uh, but I feel, I have to say, a little bit like an imposter because this is the Power of Narrative Conference. When they asked me to that, to, to speak at a Power of Narrative Conference, I was a little self-conscious because narrative is not something I've done a lot in the last five years. To write a true narrative story, as I think of it, you need to be sort of swimming in facts. You know, you need to know the dog's name. You need to know what the dog had for breakfast. You need to know who fed the dog breakfast. You need to know enough information, enough facts to let your readers sort of stand in the shoes and see the world through the eyes of their protagonist. So I cover the Trump organization and uh, it is not like that, unfortunately. Uh, I celebrate when I find a fact and I don't celebrate every day, <laughs> okay? Uh, but I still love this job and I think it's an amazing beat uh, because every one of the facts that we find a is important, B has a huge audience, and C is something that often people would not know if it wasn't for us. So we find facts one at a time, um, but I think there's a lot to learn from that experience. So the only narrative I can give you is my own narrative. Uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about my experience covering President Trump's finances, his, both his charity in 2016, and then his business since then. Uh, and then I wanna talk a little bit about maybe some lessons that we've learned uh, that my other folks who are encountering similarly Stonewall, uh, you know, similarly secretive organizations um, might be able to use. So just a little bit about me, uh, I told you a little bit too. I've been at the Post for 21 years. I covered politics for about half that time. And one of the things that appealed to me about journalism, but particularly about political journalism originally, was that yeah, I have a, maybe this is true for you too. I have an extremely short attention span, right? Nat, nat like. Uh, and the thing that I liked about political journalism for a long time was the hyperactivity of it, the turnover. You know, I'd spend four days writing about or learning about Ted Cruz. I'd write a story about Ted Cruz, write a story about Ted Cruz, done. Forget about Ted Cruz, on to Marco Rubio, on to Rand Paul, on to whoever. And I liked that I was sort of becoming an expert in something every week and I didn't have to follow the same storyline every week. Uh, it was a beat, but it wasn't really a beat in the way that most people think of beat reporting. Um, so. Then somehow in 2016, I managed to stumble onto a beat that was the opposite of all that, that was, you know, was completely contrary to my uh, past experience and to my nature as a person with short attention span. I stumbled onto Trump and it happened in Iowa. I had been sent to Iowa to write a, basically a feature story about Trump's, uh, Trump on the campaign trail right before the, the caucuses in 2016. So I was following him around to events in Waterloo, Sioux City, all these places. And he was doing this thing I'd never seen anybody do before at a, at, a, at a presidential rally, which was that he would stop the rally and he'd bring out this huge check, like a the size of some, like a golf tournament winner's check from a charity called the Donald J. Trump Foundation, which I'd never heard of. He'd give it to a local charity in whatever town they were in. And then the, the nice folks from the Waterloo Veterans at Home or whatever charity was being honored would say, wow, thank you. This, the checks were often for like $100,000 or more. Thank you so much, Mr. Trump. You're gonna be a great president. They'd sit down and the rally would resume. I thought that was weird. And the reason I thought it was weird and the reason I'd never seen it before is because it's completely illegal. You just can't do that. You can't use your charity uh, to help your political campaign. More on that in a second. I came back from Iowa then, and instead of moving on to the next story, I had this sort of sense that there was more thread to be pulled there. I wanted to know about this Trump Foundation sort of what was it? Where did it come from? Who gave it money? Where, who did it give its money to? 
the thing that appealed to that uh, to me about that and still appeals to me about covering Trump's business is the concreteness of it. You know, so much about covering Trump, especially in 2016, but during his presidency as well, was sort of trying to get your hands around this sort of slippery rhetoric. You know, he'd say something, and especially in 2016, we'd say, does he know what he's talking about? Does he really mean to do that? Can he really do that? And so you were just trying to nail Jello to the wall. The beautiful thing about the charity, what about money, was it can only be in one place at once. Once you found it, once you learned something about it, it stayed found. It didn't melt off away the next day when Trump said something else. So that appealed to me. I wanted to know about Trump's charity. I thought we could learn a lot about him by learning about the decisions he made with his own donations and with his charity's money. So how do you learn about a charity? Uh, I asked the Trump campaign. I thought, well, no person who knows this best is Donald Trump. Maybe he'll tell me. Um, they told me nothing. Uh, this became a familiar pattern. Um, so then I, I said, okay, well, I gotta, I have to build my own record of this charity from the outside. You know, if they won't tell me what's going on on the inside, I'm gonna have to find a way to build a record of what, what was, what's, ha what's been happening there. In that case, luckily, there was a sort of a roadmap that was already out there. Uh, these things called IRS Form 990s, which are charities have to file every year, listing their donors, their donations, uh, all their finances, and it's public. So I got those forms for Trump's, ch Trump's charity going back to 1988. And I basically just made a giant spreadsheet, uh, hand or enter data of everybody that had given the charity money, everybody that charity had given money to. And then I thought, okay, well, you know, I can't see into this black box of what was going on in the charity, but all these people I've just found, the donors and the recipients, they saw a little bit. They didn't see the whole thing, but they know what happened with their little transaction. And so if I talk to every one of them, if I try to talk to every one of them, I can add up all the little perspectives they got and maybe see something of the whole. So I started calling. Um, and the spreadsheet ended up having about 4,300 cells of hand, hand in their data. And I started calling all these people and saying, you know, what was your connection to the Trump Foundation? Why did you have a connection with it? You know, tell me the story. Uh, and it, as I did that, I sort of, to, to show people what I was doing, I started also posting my notes on Twitter. I called through this list, trying to learn more about Trump's charity and his giving to charity. I wanted people to see how much work I was doing and some, kind of keep them interested. So I, I was keeping the data really in a computer spreadsheet, but I was also tracking it uh, on a notebook people could look at. And uh, over the course of that year, I found some really interesting things about Trump's charity. Uh, Trump had misused the charity's money to buy giant portraits of himself. He used it to pay off debts that his business owed. And he used it, obviously, to help his political campaign. All those things are against the law. Um, so my reporting became the basis of a New York Attorney General uh, investigation of the Trump Foundation, eventually a lawsuit against Trump over the foundation, and a $2 million penalty that Trump was ordered to pay by a New York judge. So that was my 2016, but the, the more important thing that happened in 2016 was that Trump got elected president. And then uh, my co-reporter and I, Jonathan O'Connell, I got to team up with a great real estate reporter then, we said, okay, well, we got to cover the Trump organization, this business. It's kind of a small empire of there's condo buildings, there's office buildings, hotels, golf courses, two ice rinks, an ice cream shop. Uh, it's not a big business, but it's a very varied business. We want to understand what's happening with it. Our think thinking was, look, the president is keeping ownership of this business in the White House, which means when the president looks out at the world, he sees two halves of his life. He sees the business half, all the things that are happening at his businesses, if they're doing well, if they're struggling, if they need help, who is patronizing them, who they're is setting up business relationship with, relationships with, and he sees the government half. But we as the public can only see half of that world. We see the government half, but the business half of Trump's life is dark to us. We don't know what's happening there. And our thinking was we can't understand Trump's presidency and his actions without trying to see the dark half of the world that he can see, but we can't. So we needed to understand everything we could about the Trump Foundation. Okay, again, what's, what's the easiest way to do that? I'm sorry, the Trump Organization. What's the easiest way to do that? Well, you could just ask Trump, or in this case, his sons who were running the business in his stead. That doesn't work. <laughs> it didn't work as well as they wanted. Uh, this is a small and secretive company. It's got uh, no public reports. It puts out almost no press releases. The press releases it do, does put out are usually about different golf holes. It has a spokeswoman, but she rarely speaks. Um, in fact, for the preparation of this speech, I was going back and looking at my email over the last year my sent emails, and I sent the Trump Organization about 160 requests for comment in the last year. So, you know, more than one every couple of days. Uh, but the, or I guess a little less than one every couple of days. 
Uh, I got about 16 responses in that front time frame. So the response rate is not great. We ended up in the same position we were, we were at with the Trump Foundation. If we were going to understand what was happening in this company, we needed to find other sources. We needed to find documents, but mostly we needed to find people. In the same way we've done with the Trump Foundation, everybody we can find who has a connection to this company, who sees a little bit inside the black box, if we can talk to them, capture what they know, you know, think of it like points in a pointless painting. You know, every one of those little data points starts to add up to something more important. Um, so how do you do that? How do you find those people? And the way we did it was just by looking for everybody we could think of with some kind of connection to the Trump Organization. So start with golf club members. We, look, we scraped uh, golf websites to find places where Trump golf members had posted their scores and listed their affiliation with Trump golf clubs. We made a list of all those folks. It was about, um, about 3,600 names. So we got all those people, we started compiling their contact information. Another group was investors in Trump's property. So Trump owns a bunch of hotels in which he did this weird, weird thing, both to me and in the hotel industry, where he sold off the individual hotel room. So say you go to Trump Las Vegas, you stay in some room. To you, it just looks like another room in the hotel. But legally, that room is owned by you know, Joe Blow from Schenectady, and he is a, a partner with Trump. He gets, the, he gets a share of the revenue that room generates. For us, that was important because everybody who owned one of those hotel rooms also gets a little bit of information about how the whole, whole hotel is doing. Sometimes just figures about their room, but sometimes also like here's profits and losses, revenue changes for the whole hotel. Uh, they can sit in on meetings about the Trump Hotel's operation. So you can learn a lot from them. So we scraped uh, property tax records to get all the, the contacts of all the people who own these individual units. Um, that was another maybe uh, 1,500 more names. Um, then we looked for current and former members of the Trump organi organization, employees uh, and ex-employees. That was about 500 more names. And then we started looking for government data, um, started looking for, for uh, records from the US government because we knew that Trump was going to his properties and that his um, Secret Service agents were following and that probably they were being charged for their rooms, but we didn't know how much or how often. And we also knew that uh, local governments might have information about Trump Org because uh, to lower its property taxes, Trump Org would sometimes send financial data about its properties to local county governments to say, look, you know, things are going so bad at our property, lower our taxes. And so we could learn something about them from that. So <laughs> what followed, there was a lot of data, but you can't call it data journalism. To me, data journalism is something much more impressive than what I was doing, right? What we were doing was basically data entry journalism, filling spreadsheets with contact information and with any data we could find from any of these sources. So with a conversion rate, we started emailing, usually email because it was a little easier to hit a bunch of people at once. We started emailing all of these people and the conversion rate was pretty low, pretty, pretty, mostly not responses, sometimes hostile responses. Uh, one man, particularly an investor in many Trump properties, wrote back telling me not to contact him again. And he added uh, 62 exclamation points, presumably because 61 might have left some ambiguity about whether he really wanted to be contacted again, 62 seal it. But this, in all those no's and all those non-responses, we started to get some response replies out of, you know, 4,000 Trump golf club members, we got 30 or 40 who want, were open to talking. Out of 1,500 investors in Trump hotels, we got you know a few dozen. And those people, their information, as small as it was, every bit of it was stuff that you couldn't get any other way. They had something, every one of them, that was unique, that was unusual, that hadn't been revealed before. And you know, so there, sometimes there was a really quick payoff to that. One of my um, first encounters with a Trump club member uh, this guy said, oh, yeah, you know, we, we reached out to him by email. He said, oh, yeah, sure, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll um, bring you to my club. You know, let you see the inside of the Trump club. So I go there and have dinner with him. And I'm just looking around. I hadn't been in this Trump club before. I'm just looking around the club. Obviously, the theme of most Trump, the decor theme of most Trump properties is uh, Trump. Uh, there's just giant pictures of him everywhere. But when I was visiting with this person, I, something caught my eye on the wall of this uh, Trump club. There was a, a framed Time magazine cover from 2009. And it looked a little off to me for a couple of reasons. The design was kind of weird. Also, it was just a giant picture of Trump and all the headlines were also about Trump. In Time magazine, usually there's a guy on the cover, but there's different subjects in the headline. This, the, all the headlines were like, Trump is doing great. Sure, sure is great to be Donald Trump. He's hitting on all cylinders. I thought, when was the last time 
Time Magazine just did this one whole issue about how great some guy was. And so I took a picture of it, thought it was weird, went back to the office the next day, discovered it was fake. It was a fake Time Magazine cover. Uh, they, Time Magazine had never produced the cover in 2009 about Donald Trump. Uh, it, it was made up. Uh, and so that was a great story. We, we ended up doing you know, a lot of searching. We figured out that Trump had hung this fake Time Magazine cover of himself at like, I think 12 or 13 of his properties around the country, including in his own office in Trump Tower. It was on display in Trump's own office. Um, great story about you know, the sort of world of BS that he swims in. Uh, but there's one, I have one regret about that story, which is that I never figured out who was being fooled. Was it him trying to fool his, his uh, club members by putting this fake thing, fake uh, Time Magazine cover on the wall? Or was he being fooled? Was it, did his employees think he was in a funk in 2009, which is not a great year for him, and, make, and say like, hey boss, you're on the cover of Time Magazine, and he didn't know. I've, I've still never been able to figure out the, the, the sort of illusion and uh, BS that permeates that world. Sometimes, you know, maybe even the purveyors don't understand when they're being fooled. Um, but other times, that was a great example of a, you know, finding a source that produced a great story immediately. Other times, though, um, the, the, the results, the fruits of this labor would come in kind of haphazardly and often unexpectedly. People would call back, FOIAs would get returned. At times when um, I wasn't working on a story about whatever the data was about, or you know, it wasn't anything, it wasn't enough for a story on its own. So that's when the sort of second part of this work, and to me, the more frustrating, hardest part of this work came in. My job, in addition to finding all these sources and trying to write stories about what they tell us, my job was to catalog information. And when it came in, I had to take whatever I just learned, you know, revenue figures from Trump's ice rink, you know, uh, some statistics about Trump's hotel, whatever it was, I have to make sure that I enter that into my spreadsheets, into my data, you know, whatever I've chosen to catalog the data. And then I enter it completely and I put context around it such that a stranger could understand it, right? I can't leave any shorthand abbreviations, you know, anything and rely on myself to say, oh, I'll know what that means. This is written so that a stranger could pick it up and immediately know what it is and why it matters. And the stranger in this equation is me. You know, in the, in the world of covering Trump, two days from now, two weeks from now, so much craziness will have happened that honestly, I often would come back to stuff I'd seen earlier in the week and don't not remember it at all. So that was important for me was to catalog everything and make sure I understand the source of it, the value of it, and the, any, any other context that would help me use it. So that was sometimes hours a day. Just to give you an example. So we, we requested all these, we've been getting all these FOIAs about Secret Service spending at Mar-a-Lago. I'll talk about that in a minute. But whenever it comes in, I have to sort of catalog it, staple it together, write the source, put a number on it so I can tell one transaction from the other. So today we just got a lot more FOIA documents from the Secret Service about Mar-a-Lago. So what I'm going to do today, I'm not, I'm not going to write a story about this today. What I have to do today while it's fresh in my mind is take this and put it in here in the right places. Um, what I think of myself as doing is sort of building, you know, in this sea of lies and misinformation, building little islands of fact, right? One rock at a time. It gets, you know, get above the waterline. And once it's built, it stays built. But you know, if I don't catalog that information and put the context into it right away, I lose it. It goes back in the ocean. So that was a frustrating part of my job, especially for someone with a short attention span like I have, to think about cataloging information every day um, and, and making that a part of the job, whether I think I'm going to write about that topic today or next week or never. So um, as time went on, we started to see the payoff of this. We know both we allowed us to break stories when new data came in, and also the catalog data helped us to immediately see context that nobody else had about the Trump Organization. Just to give you an example of uh, a couple examples of that, after Charlottesville in 2017, Trump said they were quote unquote, very fine people on both sides among the white supremacist rioters. Mar-a-Lago's roster of charity clients, people who had held charity galas at Mar-a-Lago started to quit. And we knew immediately how big that universe was and how important those, um, those, those people quitting were because we had gone through the trouble of scraping the Palm Beach social registry going back five or six years and building a database of everybody who'd held a charity ball at Mar-a-Lago. So we knew what the universe of people who could quit was, and when they started quitting, we knew what a big deal it was. Uh, another example, when Trump in 2019 shows his own Doral Golf Resort as the site of the G7 summit, basically awarding an enormous government contract to itself, we had a context that nobody else had, which was that Doral, his, which this resort he'd been praising so much, was in terrible financial shape. 
We had documents we'd gotten from the county uh, that Trump had submitted to the Miami-Dade County to get a tax break that showed the, the, the resort was in steep, steep decline because of Trump's politics. So that was context to Trump's decision that he should give this big award to himself. When I think about this line of reporting, uh, to me, the most satisfying story, I don't know if it was the biggest story, but the, the time when it all came together um, was one instance in 20, I think it was in 2019, we had been looking for Trump employees and from Trump employees, we, one of them, we got, we got data that helped us build a whole new spreadsheet of all new people who'd know something. This person passed us um, VIP arrivals sheets from Trump's hotel in DC. These are basically every day they hand out to the employees, here are the big muckety mucks who are coming in today because they're rich, because they're important to Donald Trump politically, you know, they're holding a big conference, they're getting married, whatever. Here are the people checking in every day that are important. And so we got a whole bunch of those and we started to build a database every day. Who are the VIPs checking in? And we saw this incredible pattern, which was the media, the telecom company T-Mobile. They had announced in, uh, I think in June or April, May, 2019, 2018, that they were gonna try to merge with Sprint, put on this big merger of telecom companies. This was gonna make them a ton of money if it went through, but it had been blocked by the Obama administration in the past. So they were hoping that Trump would say yes to something that Obama had said no to for anti-competitive reasons. So the T-Mobile executives announced this huge merger that needs Trump's approval. The next day, eight of them fly across the country from Seattle and check into the Trump Hotel in Washington. And they stay for long, long periods. And we see them in this database we have, we're getting, we're, we're entering all the data about uh, other VIP arrivals lists on other days, we're seeing that they came back again and again and again. When they needed Trump's help, they became huge Trump customers. So we start reporting on this and you know, trying to understand how much money they put into Trump's pocket and you know, what benefits they might have derived. And the last piece we need is we need to find John Legere, who is the CEO of T-Mobile, or was at the time. Um, we need to know where he was to ask him, like, hey, why are you, you know, he actually had had a big Twitter beef with Trump a couple of years earlier. Why did you change your mind and become such a loyal Trump customer? And we're looking around for him. Is he in Seattle? Where is he? How do we interview him? And then one of our sources calls us to tell us that he, John Leger, the CEO, is now at this moment running around, jogging around Lafayette Park in front of the White House, wearing a T-Mobile shirt, like wearing a T-Mobile outfit in the color of T-Mobile, running around in front of the White House. And so we think, oh, well, I wonder if he's going back to the Trump Hotel. Um, and so our, my co-reporter, Jonathan O'Connell, goes to the Trump Hotel, waits in the lobby, and who should come in but a sweaty T-Mobile CEO. Um, so you know, while we're reporting this story on him patronizing the Trump Hotel, he actually turned out to be patronizing the Trump Hotel at that very moment. We got, a, we got an interview with him in the lobby. And then later that day, he switched to the Four Seasons for unknown reasons. Uh, so this reporting was very rewarding after a while, and we started to see that work pay off. And I don't think there was really any other way to get what we got. Um, and the, the, the thing that, one of the benefits of that approach was I started this to feel like I did in 2016, which is that I have shown people how hard I'm working. I have pushed my reporting to the limits of what I can get in, under normal reporting practices. Now people, I can, I've sort of laid the groundwork to go to social media. I've used social media as a reporting tool in the past, but I feel like it's very important to show people how hard you've worked and how specific your needs are before you go to social media and say, hey, I need this thing. So uh, in 2020, um, the most powerful example of that, where we had used this the techniques I've described to get ourselves in a place where we could ask for help. Um, we've been trying to find out how much money Trump um, had basically funneled into his own pocket by making the government spend money at his resorts. So when he'd go to his resorts, the Secret Service, the State Department, State Department, the Defense Department would follow. Trump organization would send the government a bill, sort of like a, you know, what they call a self-looking ice cream cone. He could basically, his decisions as a president could make him money as a businessman. But how much? We needed to know how much and how often. The only thing we knew about, or we thought we knew about these transactions was that Eric Trump had said, the president's son, that the most they ever charged the government was 50 bucks a night, 50 bucks a night for a hotel room, the least they possibly could. We wanted to see if that was true. So we started putting in FOIAs uh, to the State Department, to the Secret Service, um, we started getting some data back, but the big question mark was the, the State Department. Trump had held a bunch of summits with foreign leaders at Mar-a-Lago, which means the Secret Service and the State Department will pay for everything. Even though it's on American soil, if it's a meeting with a foreign leader, the State Department pays. Well, how much did he charge? He could have charged them anything. So we FOIA the State Department. They didn't give us anything. We sued the State Department. Still didn't give us anything. Finally, in October of 2020, two weeks before the election, they said, okay, fine. You know, they tell the judge, 
They've sued us. We're ready to turn over documents. We have 300 pages of records showing State Department spending at Trump properties. You know, we'll be ready to turn them over on October 15th. So we thought, well, that's only two weeks before the election, but you know, fine, that's better than nothing. On October 15th, however, the State Department turned over two pages, two, one, two pages of documents, not 300. And they said, oh, sorry, we'll send you the rest after the election. So obviously we can't leave it there. This is you know, an important part of evaluating Trump's legacy as president, Trump's conduct as president. He's about the face of the voters again. We have to know more than just whatever's on these two pages. So then I felt like at that point we could go to, we could use social media again, we could use Twitter. And I put out a, a call saying, look, I've done this, this, and this to try to get this information the right way. It hasn't worked. Is there anybody else out there who has this information that I want? And I didn't really think there was a great chance of success because who would have these records? But somebody did. And somebody saw the tweet and somebody responded. And because of that, social media uh, reporting came through again for me because I laid the groundwork. Uh, and we got records showing all these expenditures in Mar-a-Lago during the summits, steak dinners, wine, uh, flower arrangements. The thing that stood out for me was that Trump once, he met with Shinzo Abe, the prime minister of Japan, for a, uh, like a photo op. They just said they didn't eat anything. They barely talked. They just drank water. Water was the only thing Mar-a-Lago had provided. But even that, it turned out, was not free. Uh, Trump had charged his own government $3 each for his water and Shinzo Abe's water. Nothing went unmonetized. And if it hadn't been for the work we'd done and then the social media outreach we did, we never would have known that. We were able to get that out before Trump ran for re-election. So every time we did this, as frustrating as this work was, as I said, I felt like every time we got something, we felt like, Nobody else, there's no other way we could have gotten this. And if it hadn't been for us, nobody would have seen this. So what lessons would I tell you to draw? If you find yourself covering, you know, a, an institution like this, how do you do it? But I think there's three lessons. One, except at the beginning, that you're going to have to make a long, long list of names of anybody who might have seen even a little bit of the elephant, and you're going to have to call all of them, or you're going to have to contact all of them. There's no getting around that. So accept that at the beginning, make your spreadsheet and start. Um, because if you, the longer you wait, the more behind you are. Uh, number two, and accept that your job every day, except that when, if you succeed at this, the, the fruits of your success will be that the information comes in when you sort of least expect it and maybe you don't even really need it. Accept that part of your job is data entry, is cataloging information that's come in, uh, even if it has nothing to do with what you're doing that day and contextualizing it so that you can understand it later. There's no way to skip this. There's no way to automate this. Like this has to pass through your head you know, from the from through your head to a spreadsheet because you're the filter. There's, you know, you have to in, enter all this data and you have to see it because you're counting on yourself to notice trends. You can't, you know, there's no way of, of avoiding that. The third thing I would say is that when you're doing this kind of reporting and you're relying on snapshots, when the victories are getting little snapshots of the inside the black box you're trying to look into, be aggressive in your reporting, obviously, but be humble in your conclusions. Um, one of the things we have to constantly remind ourselves in this job is we only see part of the picture. You know, we're trying to see all of it, but necessarily parts of it we can't see. And it's important to remember that and not to fill in what we can't see with assumptions, with what we want to be true, with what, what people speculate are to be true. That's a blank spot and you can't get around that. And so you, you have to be humble in your conclusions and, and tell your readers what you know and what you don't know. So you avoid misleading them or steering them in a direction based on really nothing. So that's my narrative, uh, and I'm very glad that you'll ask me to come talk about it. I'd love to take questions. Great. Thank you so much, David. That was absolutely amazing. And we have so many great questions uh, to get through. And I think um, to start with, uh, one of the first ones we got was, um, I think, relevant to any form of narrative, especially investigative reporting, but handling in your case, handling the legal and other threats by Trump and his organizations, for many other people, you know, handling um, outside pressure or, or kind of threats in that regard, um, both in terms of handling your safety, I think, and, um, you know, just in making sure you're, you're kind of, you're taking those uh, seriously, but also, um, you know, kind of moving forward from that, so. Well, uh, we, as far as safety goes, I'll address that first. I mean, there, there, there was a few, in 2016, uh, I got a death threat from somebody, um, and the Post treated that very seriously. They, you know, they paid for a security upgrade in my house. They talked to the FBI, who went out and interviewed the guy, um, and decided he wasn't much of an actual threat. 
Um, but that, that's something you always have to think about. And then again, in 2020, um, the White House said that it was assembling a quote unquote a dossier on me um, and that it would reveal something about me to somebody. Um, we never got more details about what that was. We never obviously saw the dossier. I live a very boring life. I, you know, that dossier would bore people to death. Um, but that also made us think about, okay, you know, physical security, internet security. I have to say though, that I have not had the same kind of threat or targeting that I think a lot of my colleagues, particularly female colleagues and colleagues of color have had. Um, my, you know, the abuse that I get and the threats that I get from readers, I think are a lot less than those folks um, through no doing of my own. It's no, you know, that, that's unfor an unfortunate fact of the world of journalism. In terms of legal threats, you know, Trump is obviously a very litigious person. Uh, he sued a lot of people, including journalists in the past. And we, we were very conscious of both getting this right to get it right, but also thinking about potential legal liability. So these stories were often reviewed by lawyers ahead of time. And the, I think that helped in a lot of ways because one of the things that they made us do was to be really explicit about uh, attribution. You know, everything you say, how do you know that? What's your source on that? And I think that's good because it keeps you from getting sued. But it's also just good for readers. I think, you know, the, in the Trump era, we, we were hoping to get readers who love Trump and didn't read the Washington Post very often. And, and we wanted to be able to show them what was it about what we do that makes us trustworthy. And, you know, the less you assume that, the more you make that explicit, I think you help yourself and give readers, you know, things to grab onto and understand why this story is better than something else they read online. I definitely uh, want to dive into um, some questions about uh, you know, what you called uh, social media storytelling. I definitely think that was really um, unique to your story. And um, we had a lot of really interesting questions about how you did that. And specifically, I think I want to start with um, a, how did you decide what to put out on Twitter versus saving for a future story? And were you worried about um, scoops from competitions in that way? Kind of like walk me through that process. Well, yes. I mean, I. I, I think a lot about that, you know, what, what to put on social media, you know, but, but that I haven't written yet. Um, my goal with social media, I think, is twofold. One, it's to um, bring in tips, to find people who might know something that I don't even know I'm looking for that might want to come to me. Um, so you want to reach people in that way and de demonstrate your expertise and demonstrate the holes in your expertise so people can come to you. But you also want to give readers just kind of a thing to hang on to, especially in the Trump era. There was so much happening. And I, I sort of describe it like a tornado. You know, your readers are like spinning around in a tornado and you want to just give them something to hold on to. And, you know, that can't just be, well, I write a story, you know, every once in a while when I get enough facts, you know, I'm going to write a story about Donald Trump at some indeterminate interval. You know, I just want you to keep reading until it shows up again. You know, what, what can I, I was thinking about what can I do as a reporter to like give you that thread that you can hang on to every day? Can I keep you informed and interested and, and help you, you know, not lose track of what I'm doing? And so in 2016, I tried to do that with both um, information, but also like a visual cue. And I've done this since then too, like my notebook. There's not a lot else on Twitter that looks like that. So you could, that stands out on your feed and you go, oh yeah, it's the notebook guy. I remember now what he's talking about. Um, and so, you know, what I've tried to do since then is to use, I talked about those FOIAs that you sometimes get and you don't have an immediate use for. Sometimes if your editor says, well, I don't want to store on that today, you can post pictures of it and say, look, here's, you know, just, this is what came over the transom today, you know, uh, which I, I think I might do that this afternoon. Here's a bunch of new charges from Mar-a-Lago that I just learned about. Let's look at them. And, you know, people are interested in that. And, it, and that raises interest and questions and it builds anticipation for your next story. There, there obviously is stuff that we get that we go, oh, wow, we need to be hold this, hold on to this for a story. I mean, I, you know, I want to draw readers to the Washington Post. That's how, you know, they pay my salary. But uh, if there are times when I have something that I don't think is going to rise to the level of a daily story, um, I want to use it on social media to, to kind of keep readers reading and, and to, to sort of show them what I'm doing. And you also talked about it being a collaborative experience too, though, right? Like you mentioned about the time when you asked basically on Twitter, <laughs> does anyone have these records, right? And so uh, did you see that people were kind of benefiting from that and, and um, you know, uh, jumping into the conversation and helping you out with your reporting? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, one thing I would say to, to all journalists is that, you know, there's a reason people make movies about journalists. Like what we do is interesting. It's, it's like, it may seem boring to us, on a, you know, on some days, but like we solve mysteries, you know, sometimes, or at least we try to solve mysteries. And people like that about it. People want to watch that happen. And so I think that for me, that was a really important revelation that things that I thought were kind of a boring part of my job, 
people liked sort of playing along and they liked seeing you get closer to a, you know, to build a body of knowledge and get closer to the truth. And if you do that, if you bring people into that process and they understand what you're looking for, that's when you can start to say, okay, I want your help. You know, at, at the beginning of that process, when I was last year, when we were looking for, for government records about Trump spending, I don't think it could have been there on January 1 and said, look, hey, anybody got records about what Donald Trump spent at, you know, Trump properties? And gotten anything meaningful in response. And if I had, I'm not sure I would have, I would have known the, the value of it. I think people need to see, they need to get interested in the topic, see you chasing it, see you hit a wall, and then you can say, okay, here's what I need. And that helps you both because they're already interested and they know there's a value. If they give you something, you'll do something with it. But also it helps you narrow down what you're asking for. You know, it's, it's so people have a better chance of recognizing, oh yeah, that's something I have. I definitely want to ask about your organization of all of this, <laughs> you know, there's, you showed us a couple of your file folders, your, you talked about your database, and then obviously your notebook, um, your online notebook for kind of sharing your information. How, talk, can you talk us through a little bit more of that process of organizing that and knowing what to share with people and, and how that makes up your narrative? Well, uh, as I said, I really feel like I, I'm often mocked by our data people for how much hand entry I do of data, but I do, I, there's a value to that. But it's the same way that if you're on a beat, you set up a Google alert for all the topics relative to your, to your beat, and you have to read all those Google, alert, Google alerts every day. Like everything has to pass through your head because that's when you're going to see trends. You have to see everything in order to see patterns in what you find. So um, what I've usually used is um, I use uh, spreadsheets, online spreadsheets to track everything. And, you know, and, and that includes revenue numbers we get from Trump's properties, changes in the signs on Trump's properties. I probably have like 35 active spreadsheets of various kinds, tracking different parts of the Trump organization, people we've called, people we might call. Um, but when it gets really complicated, I find I need paper. Um, and so the thing I showed you earlier, this, these um, government records about federal spending at Trump properties, anybody who's dealt with the FOIA process knows that what you get often is like out of order, without context at all. And if it's, especially the federal government, it's often these really obscure forms that have all kinds of codes on them. And you sometimes you can't even tell, is this the same transaction I saw earlier? Is this a different one? So physically for me, it's meant, you know, for every one of the transactions where the, the federal government paid Trump, I give each transaction a number, um, you know, in this, so this is like, uh, this is like SSM1, Secret Service pays Mar-a-Lago. This is the, the, the second transaction I, I categorized. And in every piece of paper that comes in from different sources that has to do with that transaction, I staple them all together. And in the case of Mar-a-Lago, then I bunch all the transactions from each trip that Trump made to Mar-a-Lago. So that's, how, that's sort of how I understand the universe of what I've already seen. And it's how I see connections between documents that come in. So I know what's unique and what's, what's a duplicate. Um, that's a huge amount of work. And it, probably there is a digital way to do that, but I'm old enough that, I, that paper um, and staples and clips is the easiest way for me to, to, to set boundaries and be sure that, that the boundaries stay. I also wanna, we had a couple questions come in about verification um, in terms of, uh, you know, we had Marty um, ask about how you guarded against kind of counterfeit information that was used to trap Dan, uh, Dan Rather in his coverage of, um, George Bush's uh, National Guard Service, and then obviously verifying the records that uh, someone sent you via your Twitter call out. You know, how do you how did you go through that process? Well, I have to say that I have not. I don't think I've ever seen a case where someone was deliberately trying to mislead me, giving me documents that didn't seem to, you know, that were made up to to mislead. You know, often you get stuff that is not what people think it is, but it, it's usually done in good faith. You know, they think they have something, and it turns out to be or old or you know fake or whatever. But they they're not trying to fool you, they may be fooled themselves. For me, Twitter is, it's a source like every other source, you know, and so stuff that comes in on Twitter, whether it's a tip or it's a document or whatever, or comes in from the public, you know, you have to do all the verification you would do with, you know, from any source. So if we get somebody saying, you know, I saw, you know, I, I, here's a document I got, or here's a report that I heard, you know, that has to be verified all the normal way. So it, there's never been a case where I got something on Twitter and I'm like, well, this is it, you know, I'm not, I, this is too good to check. Um, you know, that, that requires, and there's, and there's been lots and lots of times we've gotten tips over Twitter and social media and email that we could just never nail down. It might be true, um, but we can never nail down. It's a pretty rigorous process to go from tip to story. Um, we definitely, we had a question about, um, 
you're, I want to talk a little bit about that uh, going to the Trump Club um, with a member that invited you to dinner, right? Like, how did you handle conflict of interest like that? We have a lot of educators on the call too um, that are working with student journalists. Uh, and so, how do you did you offer to pay your host? Like, how do you how did you navigate all of all of that stuff? I believe I paid. I mean, that's always my policy is to pay in this situation. You know, the post doesn't let us take free meals from anybody, so I paid. Um, I don't think I paid then because I didn't want to, you know, I don't think the Trump employees at this club know my face, uh, you know, or that they would really care. Um, I also look like a lot of people at a Trump golf club. I, you know, I don't think people would see like a white guy in his 40s with a polo shirt and be like, oh, that guy's out of place. That's what everyone looks like. So um, I, I, but I didn't, I didn't want to pay then because I didn't want to have my name, but I paid my host back. Um, and I've done that a few different times at Trump properties. The, the, one of the, my favorite experiences was the one time I got to go to Mar-a-Lago and that I went totally, you know, there was no incognito about that. There was a group having a gala at Mar-a-Lago. And I said, I called them and said, look, I'm a reporter for the post. You know, can I buy a ticket? It's a $300 ticket. I bought a ticket. You know, I, although in that case, the, the people who were organizing the event misspelled my name so horribly that I don't think that any, if anyone was looking for me, they would have realized it was me. Like I maybe, maybe got lucky there, but that was not my doing. Um, and we're, we're slowly running out of time here. And so I definitely uh, want to talk a little bit about um, kind of what you're currently working on and next steps for you. Obviously, we're in a new administration. Um, so are you still covering the Trump organization? And, and how has that changed now that he's out of office? I had sort of planned for this year to be a transition. I thought that would be sort of covering the Trump organization a little bit and then moving on to another beat. Uh, but it hasn't really worked out that way. The, that's for a couple of reasons. One, the Trump's legal problems are so big and so interesting. We just had a story yesterday about he's facing six different investigations, 29 lawsuits, you know, at, the, at a time when a lot of his businesses are in real trouble. So there's the, the legal entanglements of Trump are unlike any president in recent history. And I want to follow that. I think it's really interesting. If it could end in the president being indicted or the president's company being sued for lots of money, that's going to be fascinating. And I, and I feel like the knowledge that I have of the, of the Trump organization you know, I might as well use it, right? Otherwise it goes to waste. Um, and also Trump's, Trump's businesses, may, he may sell his businesses or change them in a way that'll be interesting. Um, I do think that I've, maybe next year I will transition off this beat, but for now, there's a huge amount of interest in it from readers. Our story on Trump's legal problems was the most read for a lot of yesterday on the Post site. And I feel like the, there's still a lot to be told. In some ways, the Trump story was sort of static during a lot of time we were covering. The organization didn't change that much. The legal challenges were sort of stuck in quicksand. And now a lot of that stuff is moving. I definitely want to, um, there's a great question, one more that I think I, I really want to ask from Kat. Um, and she's uh, asking about how, you know, you, you talked about how, uh, you, you know, we're, we're always learning more about how toxic really the relationship on social media can be. And you mentioned, especially for women and people of color journalists. Um, you know, if, did you have some idea with your Twitter outreach that you could do this, that you had more of that freedom to do this as a white male journalist? That's interesting. Well, when I started it, I just didn't, I had very little faith that it would work. Not for that reason, but just because I, like I had 7,400 Twitter followers. I didn't think anybody would really care. I started sort of doing my reporting on Twitter in public only because I'd sort of tried every other way and it wasn't working. And I felt like I, in that case, I was trying to get attention to this, to being stonewalled. You know, Trump was stonewalling me and I wanted people to see the stonewalling as the story instead of the end of the story. And, and I also wanted, in that case, I was looking for evidence that Trump had made this million dollar donation to veterans he claimed. I wanted him to see what I was doing. He was on Twitter then. I wanted him to, him to see what I was doing in case that he wanted to cough up the details. Um, and so it grew from there, but I do agree that I, I get much less of the abuse that my colleagues who are female and people of color get. Um, and I, as I said, I don't think that's anything great, any secret that I have. I think it's a, a terrible fact of life. My one piece of advice, and I'm saying this will prevent harassment or uh, sort of toxic behavior, but the thing that I think I've learned about sort of maximizing my impact on Twitter is that I don't tweet about other stuff, right? I, I don't tweet about baseball. I don't tweet about Star Wars. I don't tweet, my, my cultural opinions are garbage anyway, and nobody cares about them. I think that's the most important thing to realize. Nobody cares about my cultural or sports opinions, and really nobody cares about any of our cultural or sports opinions. People come to us on Twitter because they want to learn about the things we write about. And so when I have something that is unusual or different, and I'm telling you something that nobody else will tell you, that's when I use Twitter. You've come to me as a subject matter expert and I'm gonna talk about my subject matter. Um, I think that's 
that's the way I've found to maximize the value of what I'm doing. You know, you've come to me for this thing and I'm going to be upbeat about it. I'm going to tell you what I'm learning and I'm not going to tell you about anything else. That's the way I found it to be the most easiest to use. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, David. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Um, we are uh, going to just take a quick uh, 15 minute break or so, and then we'll get ready for our um, headline keynote speaker uh, speakers. And so um, thank you again, David. I really appreciate it. These were great questions. Um, and thank you so much for everyone for tuning in for this. Thank you so much.